you got to have passion in life, and um, my passion is photography. I love getting out and taking pictures, and since I've been creating these videos, I've received lots of questions about 4x5 and large format photography, uh, and uh, generated a lot of interest in really what, uh, what is needed to make these old cameras work and to get the image that you want. And so this series of videos has a simple goal, the reason why I'm creating them, and that's to take you through everything you need to know from the very first video where I talked about loading film and handling film through the end where you're creating a handcrafted image in a dark room. And so we're, we're about at midway point here. This is the, uh, the last basic technique video. Uh, as a recap from our last video, we talked about the differences between uh, image and focusing when you're manipulating the uh, the standards front and back. We talked about the Scheinflug theory, which is uh, how a sharp image is determined for capture. And in this video, we're going to take it a step further and we're going to talk about depth of field and why it's different with a view camera because of the front movements. So, uh, hope you watch and thank you for watching again. Let's get right into it. So, our view camera is set up with its most basic configuration, which is parallel rear film plane and parallel front focal plane. And what I get with that is what I would get with any camera that has these two planes in parallel, and that's a uh, plane of sharp focus that's also in parallel. So these three lines all would be parallel. And then, as I adjust the depth of field with my lens, I'm going to get the exact same effect with a view camera that I would get with any digital camera that you're using, or, or any camera really that you've seen or used. And that is, as I stop down my lens, I close the aperture, my image, my depth of field for my image is going to get wider to the point where it may go off into infinity. And then as I stop, as I open the lens, as I uh, open it to its widest aperture, the depth of field is going to close down to the point where it may only be as wide as a fraction of an inch. So the element of my image that uh, is in sharp focus when I've got a uh, fully wide open lens, uh, fully opened aperture, may be just a very small amount. And so again, nothing magic here, no real difference from what we've seen. The difference comes in when I apply some amount of front tilt, and I'm going to apply quite a bit here uh, to exaggerate this so that we can talk about it. What's going to happen now is, as you see, I no longer have my three planes. Rear film plane, front focal plane, and my plane of sharp focus in parallel. So this isn't the image that I'm going to get in terms of focus. What we learned from our previous video, part three, is that when I apply front tilt, forward tilt is going to take my plane of sharp focus and it's going to tilt it down. And so again, that's recap from our last video, nothing special there. What happens then is now I have the opportunity of further manipulating my image in terms of what uh, elements of it are in sharp focus by manipulating my aperture. And so you would think as I stop down my aperture, as I close it down, I get a wide depth of field like we've talked about. You would think that the depth of field would work something like this. Well, it doesn't. And it doesn't work that way mostly because of the shine fluid rule. And that's what we covered in depth in our last video. And that basically says that all these angles, rear standard, front standard, and plane of sharp focus have to converge at some point below the camera. Well, that same rule exists for depth of field. And what happens as I close down my aperture to get a wider depth of field, the elements of my image that are going to be in focus will be based on the angle, the amount that I'm opening or closing my aperture. And the depth of field will increase in an angular way like this. And so again, keeping in mind Scheinflug, all lines must, must intersect, must converge at a point. That remains true as I, as I change this dynamic and the aperture is opened or closed, in this case closed or opened. And so I don't get this in parallel expanding depth of field. What I get is a depth of field that opens up kind of like a clamshell and closes down as I open up my lens. So stop down, I'm going to get the widest aperture and the elements of my image that are going to be in focus 
If you extend the lines of these two uh, cardboards that represent now not our plane of sharp focus, but the boundaries of sharp focus for depth of field, if you extend those to infinity, that's basically what's going to be in focus. And so with that, I get a lot of creative capabilities, a lot of creative options that I can use with a view camera. That's really the thing that turns people like me on with view cameras and probably you too. Now, a lot of this can be done in Photoshop. Photoshop now has some pretty significant uh, view camera uh, manipulation perspectives that you can have, but you know, I really want to get out in the field and I want to capture the image the way uh, I, I see it in the camera and the way I see it in my mind's eye. So, again, shine fluke, the shine fluke principle or rule remains true here. And as I go from wide to closed aperture, I'm going to get this clamshell effect for my boundaries of depth of field. Now, there's a lot you can do with that, and if you search the web, you're going to find a lot of uh, very good and creative photographers are using this and everything from uh, using this concept and, and the, uh, the sharpness that you get from manipulating depth of field with tilt, uh, and everything from portraits where you'll see somebody who's maybe sitting like this and their hands and just their eyes are in focus and everything outside of that very narrow plane with a... Uh, produced with a wide open lens would be out of focus uh, to something very different and that is images that appear to have components that have been miniaturized and that's become a really uh, popular type of photography and uh, it's actually very simple to achieve so right now we're dealing with the uh, principle of converging lines below the camera what we've talked about all this time is uh, you know the mechanism and process defined by Theodor Scheinfeld. Alright, so we brought our camera back here to in parallel lines at front and back and uh, what we've talked, to, uh, talked about up to this point really is uh, an extension of the Scheinfeld principle. All lines must intersect at some point below the camera. Well, there's a very creative thing you can do with a view camera that reverses this principle and that reverse principle is something called reverse shine flug or anti shine flug as it's come to, to be known. And that's achieved by tilting your front lens standard backwards. And by doing that then, obviously if we apply what we've learned up to this point, it's going to change my angle of sharp image so that all lines converge. And again, now since it's anti or reverse shine flug, all lines need to converge on top of the camera at some point, not below. Same dynamic, same rule, same, same result. It's just now everything is upside down. And so, uh, as I said, this is a very uh, creative element that many photographers, many uh, excellent photographers are using to capture very creative images. In fact, one of the more popular types of images that you can capture uh, with a view camera are images that have subjects that look miniaturized and it's actually very simple to achieve and it's achieved using anti shine fluke here so again if we think about before when our lens was tilted forward we had this clamshell effect for the boundaries of our uh, our depth of field as we open the lens up it gets narrower and as we close it down and close it down it gets wider well, we get the same exact thing with anti shine fluke or with our focal plane uh, tilted backwards. Okay, the clamshell still exists and it's going to open this way as we manipulate our aperture. So, a fully opened lens is going to have a very narrow depth of field on this side of the clamshell, or the boundaries around which the image is sharp. And then as we open it up, we're going to get a very wide depth of field to the point where it could be off into infinity. And so the key here is that all lines converge. So we still have the rule, the shine fluke rule, where we've got now four lines that we're dealing with, the boundaries of our depth of field. So everything within these boundaries is going to be in sharp focus. Everything out of these boundaries is going to be uh, in various levels of out of focus. 
but all lines still much must, must converge and in this case on top of the camera and the way that you capture an image that appears to have miniaturized subjects is you focus the camera such that a very narrow depth of field occurs and the subjects that you want in focus and miniaturize fall within that sharpness, that sharp uh, boundary of depth of field. And the miniaturized subjects really are, are created because your eye, when you look at an image and everything is out of focus front and back, it looks larger and anything in focus looks small. And that's how they achieve this, uh, this very interesting and creative image for miniaturization. And most of the time that's done either on a downward looking plane, a shallow downward plane, or a very sharp downward looking plane. Because again, you're trying to place subjects in this very narrow depth of field, the boundaries of depth of field, and then everything else that sits outside of this will be out of focus. And so you'll see these kinds of pictures taken in um, sports stadiums where it's from the seating down looking to the field or buildings looking out or some high point that has some downward pitch uh, so that the image can be positioned such that only what you want to be in focus here is in focus and then the, um, you know, the, the visual of having something miniaturized is there because your eye really looks at something that's sharp and perceives it differently from elements that are out of focus. And I'm seeing this now done not only with view cameras, there are some capabilities in Photoshop to be able to manipulate an image to, to get it to look like, uh, you know, that it's miniaturized through the same mechanism. There's people doing this with video. Uh, there's a lot of creative photography taking place. I, I like to use a view camera mostly because I can get that image the way I want it while I'm out in the field and while I'm taking it. That's really where I'm doing my work is to get it correct on the negative. So that's really the dynamic around depth of field, an anti-shine fluid, and then depth of field with front tilt. And if you think of it as a clamshell, that as I close down my aperture, oops, as I close down my aperture, clamshell gets bigger and bigger. Between that, front tilt, which uh, raises or lowers your plane of sharp focus, and then the left and right movements of your lens, you can really, uh, front and left swing, forgot, forgot that word for a second, front and left swing, you can really begin to see how I can create a very interesting image and have it focus in on the, uh, the elements that I want. So that's depth of field, and uh, that's our video today. As I said, that's the last basic technique that we'll be covering. Uh, and from here, we're going to go into now how we bring all these things together. And so the next video is going to be about how you actually focus this camera on the image that you want using these techniques. And what you need to do while you're, you're standing behind the glass with your loop, how to look, how to adjust, and how to really put that image in the place that you want it. So I hope you'll stay tuned. If you haven't, uh, click the subscribe button and you'll be notified when I post new videos. And other than that, I'm Joe V. again. Thanks for watching, and uh, I hope you'll watch again.